Good evening and welcome to another session of Share IT, everyone. My name is Emil Trebitska and I'm a software developer in uh, ThoughtWorks Italy. And together with Mario, Roni, Matteo, uh, we'll be the host for the event of this evening. Before passing the mic to the speakers, let me um, take two minutes of your time um, to introduce Share IT and um, what is this all about? and what is the code of, or code of conduct for uh, today's evening. Share IT is an initiative led by uh, ThoughtWorks Italy. Um, ThoughtWorks is a... Um... You want to share your screen maybe? Yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. <laughs> no. So um, ThoughtWorks is... Um... <clears throat> Um, is a um, global consultancy company. Um, we are present in a lot of countries. In Italy, our headquarters is in Milan, uh, but uh, we are working mostly remotely. Uh, I'm based in Padua, for example. Um, in ThoughtWorks, um, we put a lot of emphasis in learning, but also in teaching. A lot of our colleagues have written a lot of books. And uh, in Share IT, we, we in ThoughtWorks Italy, we try to um, share our experience and uh, uh, and continue this uh, tradition of teaching through the Share IT event. So, what is exactly um, Share IT? Our mission is to empower individuals and organizations. But how do we do it? We do it by contributing to the community by sharing with the world our experience. And um, we share our experience about technical topics like architecture, technology, but also about um, non-technical ones, like for instance, diversity and inclusion. Um, the, the, please be, be aware that um, uh, we have different uh, level of experiences. So be kind and respectful to each other. Any question is a valid question. And uh, we are here to learn from, from each other. So um, yeah, again, be kind, respectful, and um, don't be shy and ask questions. <laughs> so uh, over to you, Rosa and Rahul for the art of prioritization. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Emil. Thanks a lot for joining in, folks. I'll quickly share my screen and we can get started. All right, let me try to find the presentation. It's not super easy. Um, please give me a moment. It's not like we're not prepared. It's just creating some suspense. Uh, that's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just taking some time. All right. Uh, hi everyone, I'm Rahul here. I'm a product manager with ThoughtWorks. And over to Rosa. And get yeah. to Rosa. Yeah, hello everyone. I'll start introducing uh, myself. So I'm Rosa and uh, I'm a business analyst uh, in ThoughtWorks. And uh, today, together with Raul, we're going to talk uh, about uh, prioritization. So in particular, the talk is about the art of prioritization and uh, more specifically to the power of uh, saying no. So uh, our talk will last uh, more or less about 40 minutes, but uh, feel free to make some questions uh, in the chat if you have any. We can interrupt ourselves and try to um, reply to the different questions. And also at the end, uh, there will be um, Q&A. So talking about today, we will uh, start um, uh, thinking about uh, why what is prioritization why it is uh, so important. And uh, then we will go through what's uh, in a backlog and uh, which are the insights uh, and the methodologies that uh, we could use uh, in order to prioritize uh, in the best way. So I think that uh, we can start uh, and uh, I would start uh, with a question. So the question is, uh, what is prioritization for you? So if you want, uh, feel free to write something in a chat if you have uh, any idea. I'll stop for a moment. Uh, 
on ramp. Okay, it's deciding what not to do. It's deciding what is more urgent to get done than other things. Any other ideas? I think fair point, right? With what Matteo and uh, or the thanks lot. Yeah, what we cannot do, ordering things to be done. I think it, it's a bit of all of this, right? Eventually, trying to make sure, as as a product manager, when I think of prioritization, I think of trying to make sure we're able to deliver value to our customers, but keeping, uh, making sure we stay aligned to the goals of the organization too, right? And th that is what prioritization means by all of this, right? Making sure we don't do what is not important. Deciding what to do, what not to do, what we cannot do, among other things. Yes. Um, so I would start uh, saying that uh, all the product people uh, always find themselves uh, in a difficult situation uh, dealing with uh, so many different things, no strategic initiatives. Uh, then there are some urgent things uh, that uh, cannot be postponed. Uh, and uh, we always have to make some choices. So should I choose this? Should, should I choose to do that? So this moment of decision is really a critical moment in which we have to think really well on what we can do and where we should say no to different things in order to prioritize in the best way. So today what we want to do is share some experiences that we have faced in our everyday work and also maybe learn from you if you have some insights or some methods for priority for prioritization that maybe have worked for you yeah i'm pretty sure all of them have because they prioritize or talk over something else no so we are here to learn more from you uh, than talking about it why is prioritization so important when we build products right uh, especially in a world where we have finite resources to do something that we want to try to achieve, it is very important for us to ensure we use the resources the right way. Also, right, with everything that we choose to do, there is an opportunity cost involved, right? So for no having not chosen something else, something else instead of what we're choosing to do, right? And similarly, there's always what is called a shiny object syndrome, a state of distraction that the belief that something new could create, you know, uh, or help you achieve what you eventually want to achieve, right? And it's always new to pursue something new. And also, the more you, I mean, if you don't prioritize well and you keep building features over features, building a new feature on top of what is already existing could take longer, right? Because also exponential text matrix test uh, matrix growth, right? So it is important to use your resources the right way and not fall into these traps and ensure you're able to continue to move your product forward, uh, right? And that is also the prioritization is always crucial. And you always have to be prepared to stop your work at any point in time, right? And still be able to deliver something of value to your clients, to your organization in, in terms of what you're building. Yeah. And what tends to happen, right? With all of us working, I mean, working on building products, working in the software industry, there, there are always certain pitfalls that we fall into to sort of call them maybe bad, but common ways to prioritize. And of course, maybe we have done the same mistakes again, but we keep learning from it and improving, right? Prioritizing based on feeling. I feel this is a great feature to work on. If I have this feature, I'll get X number of customers to uh, my product. Uh, is actually a wrong way of prioritizing, right? Because you're just prioritizing based on feature, but nothing else. No data to back what you're thinking. Prioritizing just based on competition. Uh, so looking at what the competition has and prioritizing because the competition is already doing something is again wrong because they might know certain things that you don't know right now and based on which they prioritize that you don't know at the moment, right? Prioritizing based on sales request. So the sales team would always have uh, a bias to prioritize things that will eventually help them sell, help them maybe make more commissions sort out of it, right? So it is important as a product manager to look at it without that bias, right? And trying to make sure you're able to take an objective decision to prioritizing and not be influenced by others' priorities alone. And first in, first out, I mean, I think a very primitive way to prioritize, right? Anything that comes my way, I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it. Uh, it's also wrong. 
personal objective versus beneficiary objective, right? You as a product manager might have an objective. The beneficiary you, who asked for it might have an objective, not understanding each other's objective and not aligning and prioritizing based on what you think is right might also not be the best way. Having said that, maybe thinking through all of this and using maybe data uh, that you can gather to prioritize might be a much better way to prioritize, right? But of course, there are other things to look at as well. So what we're trying to say is taking these individual factors to prioritize would eventually set ourselves up for failure, right? As a product manager or, or a business analyst or depending on the role that you do in the product that you build. So make sure you're able to take multiple factors into consideration when you're trying to prioritize. Any questions, please feel free to ask us in between. We are happy to answer them. Feel free to also you know, share your comments in the chat and we can look at that and talk to you as well. Moving on, Rosa. Okay, so I would focus now on a product roadmap and building a product backlog. So I think that we should deep dive a little bit into the different phases of product development. So in particular, uh, we have uh, uh, two phases, uh, if you can go to next slide, uh, Raoul. Sure. Okay, so we have two phases. Uh, we have a phase uh, of uh, a phase of discovery in which we try to find which are the customer needs, uh, spot the market opportunity, and also the uh, opportunities for improvement. And then there is the define and delivery phase. So once we have understand, understood which are the customer needs and the market opportunity, these will fit into a strategy. And this strategy will be translated in a roadmap for each team. And this roadmap uh, will be um, <clears throat> translated into a backlog with the different activities and this will be translated into iterative development. What we have to always keep in mind is that both of these phases are iterative so it's not something static so every time we need to keep in mind which are the customer needs and the market opportunities and if we spot that uh, they are changed, uh, this uh, will change the strategy and uh, so on. So the, the roadmap will change, the backlog will change, uh, and so also the priorities uh, will change. So we always need to keep in mind uh, that uh, we should be able uh, to change uh, our priorities uh, anytime. So thinking about an example, uh, you know that now there is this uh, introduction uh, of uh, ChatGPT. So this is impacting uh, um, their competitors uh, and uh, similar businesses uh, and uh, uh, a product manager who had different priorities uh, will now have uh, maybe a focus uh, on AI search uh, capabilities in their backlog uh, and uh, they have to do it uh, really soon because there is a market uh, uh, an opportunity window in this moment uh, so welcome to the tech world uh, which is a world which is changing uh, really fast uh, and we always need to be ready to change with it. Okay, so when we we spoke about how to build a, um, about building a backlog from a roadmap and we have to say that it's something difficult. We always find some challenges while we uh, try uh, to build uh, a product backlog. So we try to spot uh, some of the challenges that uh, we, we face uh, every day. So maybe we have uh, too many things to do. We have uh, a direction which uh, changes uh, really uh, quickly or frequently from our stakeholders. Uh, maybe we also fear of missing out. We have the fear of missing out uh, on some urgent activities, uh, or maybe we don't uh, already have a strategy for the next year, and this is something that uh, uh, impact uh, our um, our backlog for the future. Or maybe there are some other kind of problems. So there could be a lack of a clear product vision. So we don't know exactly what uh, should be there in the future. So it's we have to say that uh, it's a really challenging activities and uh, for this reason uh, we want to give maybe some insights uh, on uh, which are the um, 
the things uh, that we could do in order to try to prioritize in the best way, even uh, when we have uh, all these challenges. And please feel free to write in the chat uh, if you have uh, mm, some uh, other challenges that you want to share and that you have faced uh, while, priori while prioritizing or that you are facing at the moment also. I think this, yeah, I think in order to prioritize in the best possible way, it is vital to know all elements and factors surrounding the relevant situation taken into account. This isn't always possible, exactly. I think then there's this there's also not a right way to prioritize, no. It is it's always challenging that way. Others feel free to add to the chat. We can always look at it. And moving on. <clears throat> All right, I think we've been talking about prioritization, right? And how do we get to prioritization? It is important that you as a product manager, product owner, as a person responsible for building something, has a plan first, right? And then prioritization comes later because you're trying to fit certain things to a plan based on a certain priority, right? And what is required for us to be able to plan uh, or put the plan together itself, right? And some basics here. So, especially in the software world, given, I mean, assuming most of us follow um, Agile, right? Uh, and it's super important to have some measure of complexity, right? It can be story points, it can be, uh, you know, t-shirt sizes that you want to follow, but some measure of complexity to understand what, uh, uh, what how complex are different activities that you would do on a regular basis uh, are like, right? Measure of capacity. It is important for us to understand what are the resources that are available at our disposal while we are trying to attempt building a product that we are trying to build or trying to build a feature for that matter. Velocity of the team. How uh, how does a team uh, burn story points or how fast is the team in being able to deliver what they're expected to deliver, right? So some measure of velocity of the team is super important. Window of opportunity, right? Build something that is relevant for your customers at that point in time. Don't build it because uh, uh, one year ago, it, it was discovered that you have something of priority and now you see that you have the time to do it, but maybe you already lost that window of opportunity, right? So stay relevant to what is important for your customers and the problems that you solve for them and also for your organization and the goals that your organization wants to eventually achieve. Ensure backlog reflects customer value, right? Uh, eventually, we all are building products for customers, right? Customers could be the end customers. Customers could be customers internal to the organization. Customers could be your development team within the organization. It, 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 it is eventually for someone to use the product that you build. And we need to continue to ensure at all times that the backlog that we create reflects customer value, right? And, through, and delivering on what is there in the backlog, you are essentially solving a customer problem, right? Uh, that you sign to solve. And the backlog stays relevant. What tends to happen, especially given what Rosa said earlier, right? We need to keep pivoting uh, to ensure that uh, we discover customer habits better, uh, understand the opportunity in the market and pivot, right, if required. This would mean your backlog can keep changing. And at some point in time, you might have a 500, uh, you know, a card backlog and you, you would also be scared to look at it. But you should never get to that point, right? You should always make sure your backlog is within your control and is always relevant. If required, go back and delete what cards are not relevant, right? Or move them to archive and so that they don't come into your vision and derail you from planning the right way. So it is essential to make sure these basics are followed. But if you have any other thoughts on what, what is essential to even plan, please put that on the chat. We would like to take a look at it and learn from you on, on this. Moving on. Okay, now we spoke about backlog, right? What comprises a backlog? A backlog comprises of different types of work, right? Uh, let me call it different items in itself, right? Um, strategic initiatives, small enhancements, bug fixes, take tips, and continuous improvements. What is a strategic initiative, you may ask, right? I would like to take an example here. Also, given what's happening, I know a lot of you might have tried your hands with ChatGPT and be reading about how uh, Google is now scared of what's happening in the search world, given search has been their revenue driver, right? And if, if I take Google based on the knowledge that I have, 
one core priority for them right now is to get what they call BART, right? Their search, uh, AIML search capability up and running for customers. And that would be a strategic priority for Google right now. And what they are trying to essentially do based on whatever we've been hearing is they are trying to ensure they're able to put more effort and time on continuing to build that strategic initiative, right? Because they're at a very pivotal point in the history of how search has been functioning throughout, right? In, in, in the current generation that we are part of. Now moving to small enhancement, I'll take the case of Google itself, right? While Google continues to work on BART, let us say the search uh, engine with AIML capabilities, they already have Google search, which people continue to use. And they need to continue to enhance or delay their customers with what they have to offer. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with what is called the Kano model, right? It essentially states that you need to keep delighting your customers, right? And delight in your customers is not a momentary activity. You need to keep doing it. And as a result, I mean, using small enhancements, you can keep building something that is of value to the customers, which they'll be happy about, right? Uh, to keep them hooked to what, what uh, you deliver, right? For example, Google Lens, and things like that, that Google has been trying to build on top of search or search using pictures and things like that. They're trying to keep delighting customers, giving them something to keep moving in the direction of ensuring customer loyalty, right? And build that hook with the customer. Bug fixes, right? And we, we, we keep hearing about, again, taking the same case of Google, how uh, Google also spends a lot of money on bounties for people who identify bugs in their ecosystem, right? So, and they spend time and energy to resolve those bugs. So bug fixes also are part of the backlog uh, that any product would have, because again, we are all human, we tend to make mistakes. Uh, and also we might not have thought through what, what could actually happen and what, how complex is certain things that when we implement them. So bugs tend to happen as well. Take this, right? So there are times when we have to rework on certain tech decisions that we took because of multiple reasons, right? And it is important that we spend some time and energy on a regular basis to be able to fix them so that we don't accumulate a lot of tech debt, which will uh, eventually uh, be detrimental for us to move faster, right? So tech this is another backlog item that would always, I mean, most often be there and it's important that we work on them. And continuous improvement activities, right? So uh, when you form a team and most of an agile teams are small, it is important for the team to talk to each other, understand how we can improve as a team and also look at other activities like, for example, feature toggle removal, right? So there are a lot of teams which build feature toggles when they, uh, when they you know, write code to production and you toggle on off depending on what is the need of that, uh, that particular time, right? And, uh, and on a regular basis, you, the team takes time to remove those feature toggles or they keep accumulating, right? And these are the kind of activities where you would want to spend some time so you're able to, on a regular basis, improve what you built. And in addition, like I was saying, right? Maybe spending time on uh, thinking through better ways to work for a team is also time that the team invests in improving continuously, right? In being able to deliver faster or move faster or move in the right direction that the team is expected to move. Moving forward on oh. planning a sprint. Yeah, Rosa. Yeah, Rosa. planning a sprint. So planning is a crucial step to deliver the customer value during iterative development. So the ideal approach, so what we have always to keep in mind is uh, uh, to track some metrics. So define the capacity for every type of task. I mean, uh, how how big they are, they are the activities that uh, we are going to carry on based on the experience that you have had with your team and some data if they are available. But as we said before, I mean, we need to be prepared to pivot or change when it is required. So inside our sprint, which is planned, we need to identify the must haves and the things that are negotiable so that we can have like a contingency plan for every sprint. So why, while we go to planning a sprint, we will focus, uh, we will dedicate, let's say, a different um, percentage of our capacity to the different uh, items uh, that are in the backlog. No, So strategic initiative, small enhancement, bug fixes, tech debt reduction, and continuous improvement. So the ones that uh, Raul just uh, talked about. But what we have to keep in mind is that the focus on each of these items will change basing on the 
uh, product phase, pro product development phase in which we are. So for example, when we start working on something, if you could go to next slide. Yeah. Um, we will have uh, like a strong focus uh, on the strategic uh, initiatives. So most uh, of our effort uh, will go on focusing on the strategic initiative. While just after a release, uh, the uh, capacity dedicated to strategic initiatives uh, will be less, uh, but we will be focused uh, also on the bug fixes uh, which could have been emerged uh, from the release uh, um, and also to some small announcement. Uh, then, in the phase of uh, enhancement and maintenance, uh, maintenance uh, we will have uh, a little bit more focus uh, on strategic initiatives again, uh, also working uh, on some small enhancements and uh, also a reduction uh, with respect of uh, the, the phase in which we have just releases uh, to the bug fixes. So also here is not uh, something static, the focus uh, that we should have uh, um, in each sprint, uh, but will depend uh, on the different phase uh, um, in which we are. Yeah, uh, actually, rightly so, right? like, uh, like we're talking about the different aspects continuous improvement for example just after release you learn a lot more about the team because it is very intensive right and you understand where the team got things wrong how could we improve our way of working to be able to do better and so you spend maybe more time on that and similarly bug fixes like rosa was saying right because you introduce bugs in the system till then you haven't released yet right so it is important to understand which phase and there could be more i mean we probably put just put together start and just released enhance and maintain but there could be other ways to also allocate this time uh, and effort uh, on the different buckets. A any any comments till now, folks? I, I really miss audio, no? It would, be, would have been nice with audio. So thinking about it now. Anyways, moving on, Data saying no. Yeah, why is, or oh, what is the art of saying no, right? And why is it important? Uh, so given all of what we were, we've been talking about, right? I think as a product person, as someone who is uh, interested in the responsibility of building quality software for your customers to achieve the goals of the organization, it's important for you to say no to tasks that does not align with what you are trying to achieve, right? Why do you have to do it? Because all of us work with teams, right? And I mean, with a team and they all have expectations. They have, they are all human and the more we take on our plate, right? We, we uh, Anything that comes my way, I'll get my team to work on it. You are overloading the team, right? And that can lead to team morale dropping. So it's important to avoid overload on the team and ensure that the team has clarity on what is the focus for the team and for the product that you're building or the feature that you're building, right? And this clarity is super important. The moment you lose that clarity, you'll end up working on too many things and not be able to show the right progress to your uh, end customers, to your management uh, from a product perspective, right? And not be able to achieve the goal that you're set out to achieve. Uh, and this is super important because this also involves people and their emotions, right? Especially when, when you take too many things on your plate. Because I've had instances where, I mean, we had to work on too many things and it, it actually demoralizes the team, right? And, and that responsibility is most often on you. And of course the team is res responsible for itself too. But someone who owns the product has to take the initiative and ensure they don't push the team beyond what the team is supposed to be doing uh, in, in the focus area that the team has, right? And quality. Like we were saying, quality will go for a toss when you do too many things. Again, focus is really important, right? Instead of doing 10 things at a time, okay, focus on what is really important, maybe the five buckets and see where you need to focus and, uh, uh, and ensure we deliver quality software, right? Consistency and predictability. Knowing what you will deliver for uh, the next sprint, the sprint after maybe the next three months will actually give you the confidence to be able to say, hey, this is when we will deliver something. Uh, rather, if you take the approach of okay, taking all on your plate, it will always be very difficult for you to sort of, uh, you know, work through all of these, right? And juggle between the different priorities that you've set out for yourself, which, uh, which would be counterproductive eventually, right? And you wouldn't be able to consistently deliver value to, like we said, customers, organization, and the product that uh, you are trying to build. 
Yes, just to add uh, to what you yeah. just said, Raul, because I saw that at the beginning, uh, where when we ask uh, what prioritization is for you, like there were some people who actually said, like, decide uh, what we can not do. No, so th this uh, is related to learning how to say no. And I think uh, it's also because it's the most uh, difficult part. No, also mm, uh, in relation to the uh, interpersonal. Uh, um relations uh, i mean it's really it would be really more uh, easy to <laughs> to say to your main stakeholder yes i can do everything but in the end the final result uh, um would be would not be good because uh, as you were as you were saying uh, i mean there will be overload uh, of the work so the team model could drop uh, or uh, other in in another case uh, maybe you can do everything but the quality will not be good so at the point you will ask yourself uh, what was the point uh, of doing uh, so many things uh, but uh, with poor quality no so exactly yeah rosa I think I'll move on to the next slide. Dealing with what complaints are the backlog. I also noticed a couple of charts. Just a minute. Usually bugs are not estimated. How do you measure gauge their weight in the overall backlog? We talk about bugs. Maybe we can we can touch upon this in that slide. Right, Rosa? Yes. And there are some urgent circumstances that pushes you to find solutions by stepping out the consistency and predictability comfort zone. Uh, actually true. Uh, I, I think that also is part of the backlog because I think that's again something that we'll talk about, uh, uh, Laura. Let us let us move on and maybe we talk about them. But we start with strategic initiatives because this is most often very important for organizations. Right? It might not be for the today uh, or the product that they're building today, but it could also be for the future. Right? Uh, uh, taking the same example of Google Bard, it was in the making for a long time. Right? Now is when maybe they are unveiling it because they realize that this is a pivotal point. Uh, for search itself, right? And they're most often non-negotiable and would require consistent effort from the team to deliver, right? So it, it's not something that you can just deliver in a sprint. It'll maybe take multiple months for the team to deliver, right? Uh, having said that, how do you now, given this, given that they are going to be long living in your backlog, how do you ensure you deliver value from a strategic um, initiative standpoint? Can we have visible customer value delivered, right? I think with every card that we play for a strategic initiative, right? Every feature that we prioritize, what customer value, what visible customer value are we delivering? It's something that the product people need to ask themselves and also the team, right? The team needs to ask themselves and also the conversation with the team should revolve around what customer value are we delivering? Do we have a mechanism to measure the likely impact that is expected, right? Uh, because it, it is always important, especially given we continue to keep building, how are we tracking whether we are in the right direction or not? So even if customer is not, let us say, going to use what you're building right now, how do we how do we think of ways to measure the impact when the customer would start using it? Or maybe even before, right? When you are, let us say, in, in the test statements and things like that. Are there any dependencies that need to be addressed before we prioritize a card? What tends to also happen, right? Especially the strategic initiatives, which could be long running. Uh, there could be multiple teams uh, to whom this responsibility is interested, right? And it is important that you're able to sort of integrate and work seamlessly across teams and understand what is the dependency that each of the teams would have in every card that you play. And so that, that collaboration conversation needs to regularly happen so as for, uh, so as for the team to understand uh, how different teams are planning something that you also have on your backlog and why it is important for you to perhaps nudge them to prioritize it if it's required, right? So that conversation is really key. Uh, moving on to the next one. Small enhancements and continuous increments, right? Like I was saying earlier, it's important to keep maybe or attempt delighting your users at all times, right? So that you're able to keep that hook to them and they continue to work or use your product that, uh, that you built for them to solve problems that you you're set out to solve. How do you prioritize these? Reserve some bandwidth for these activities, like we said earlier, right? So based on uh, the velocity, uh, story points or complexity that you calculate, try to ensure, understand what's the velocity of the team, velocity for the team, and just set aside some bandwidth for small enhancements in particular, and also continuous improvement, like we said, maybe 10%, 15%, depending on the stage uh, or the, the sort of journey in the product or the phase of the product that you are in, right? Now, like we clearly mentioned here, bandwidth can vary based on the phase of the product. And the challenge, right, with small enhancements are continuous improvement. 
uh, like we said right if you don't do what uh, you've been relating users for a long time but then you completely forget it and you say okay let me work on strategic initiatives alone for a long time it will increase the distance between you and the customer the customer will expect something better from you but you won't be able to deliver you won't be delivering them regularly and that can mean they'll have other options to go and use right uh, same is the case with like we were talking about uh, let us say in the case of search there are a lot of other options that customers have if not google right and it's easy for customers to move from one to another so the loyalty will not stay forever right and similarly from continuous improvement standpoint like we said earlier i mean talking to a team the retros that we have within the team right is also a way to uh, uh, continuously improve the team right, in terms of how we could have done something better yeah and these are super important so the team is the team stays uh, uh, aligned to the goal the team is also introspecting into how they can continuously deliver better quality software iteration over iteration now moving on to uh, bug fixes and maybe we'll also address allegra's question here go on aruza yeah so talking about bug fixes uh, uh, as a product person you will encounter always like urgent items uh, or bugs uh, i mean quite on a regular basis and for that reason what's uh, important uh, is that we ensure that the team uh, is able to absorb uh, a certain amount uh, um, of uncertainty in every iteration so we mentioned before that uh, I mean, the uh, attention, the focus that uh, we um, should uh, um, give uh, to the different uh, items inside the backlog changes uh, with respect of the development phase uh, in which we are. So um, the importance uh, could be, for example, just after a release, uh, we will uh, reserve uh, uh, some capacity, I mean, uh, uh, more than usual uh, to the bug fixes. Uh, it's true that uh, usually bugs are not estimated. Uh, and for this reason, we are talking about uh, uncertainty because uh, maybe uh, there will be any, maybe there will be more than expected. So for this reason, uh, what we can do is uh, um, having a sort of triage for the bug fixes. So whenever we have uh, uh, many bugs uh, in, in our backlog, or I mean some of them, what we should think about is that uh, uh, if we should accept them in the in our current sprint, maybe because they are something really important to fix at the moment and cannot wait, or if it's something that uh, we could reject uh, and defer to uh, one of uh, the next sprints. So what we need to keep in mind really is that uh, um, like uh, keeping track uh, of uh, how frequently you need to do this triage, which means usually that uh, there are more than a uh, uh, few bugs uh, because if this triage becomes frequent, uh, probably there could be a need uh, to spend some time uh, in order to improve quality and, and fix uh, directly the route uh, from which uh, the bugs uh, are coming uh, instead of uh, doing this triage uh, so, so much. Also, just to add, right, the, the other way, just to also answer the question, we could also do which, for example, I do in the current team that I manage, we have dedicated capacity for bugs every sprint, right? One person from the team uh, assumes the role of uh, bug fixer and they continue to work on bugs that come the team's way. And if we see that all the prioritized bugs are fixed, they go back to pairing on other cards as well. And we historically try to understand what is the amount of you know time and effort that we are spending on bugs and try use this as a measure to be able to decide on the priority. Should the person spend one entire sprint on bugs or is it just half a sprint that we need to spend on bugs? So something like that can also be done, just to just to answer the question. I mean, I've also seen teams, especially these days, right? Uh, uh, even tracking bugs with story points of sorts. Maybe not with the same, you know, same sort of complexity that you track the regular user stories in, but in a different way. But a different way. But being able to say, hey, this bug is more complex, was more complex to solve than something else, right? So using a different way to track bugs. And then, as uh, you know, get the person to work on the bugs and see how you can sort of manage the capacity of the person involved in solving bugs. So, I mean, the, again, it, again, it becomes the prerogative of the team to decide how you want to try solve it. But if you know this is the problem that you're trying to solve, maybe you can look for different solutions when the team has an agreement uh, on that. Moving on. 
Yeah, yeah, moving on to tech debts. So the the last uh, backlog item that we're looking at. So uh, as mentioned before, sometimes, uh, for example, it could be in order to deliver a functionality, it is necessary to take some technical decision, uh, knowing that uh, in the future they will probably need uh, a rework. Also here, uh, comparing to the bug fixes, we have to not to do a sort of triage, but uh, uh, keep in mind uh, two measures. So which is the value of fixing uh, uh, the tech debt and uh, which is uh, the cost of fixing that? So we can uh, imagine these two um, these two metrics uh, in a matrix. Uh, so basically, obviously, if the cost of fixing it is low and the value of fixing it is high, uh, is uh, a no-brainer, so uh, something that we should do now. And uh, al also, if the cost of fixing it is low, uh, but also the value of fixing it is low, it could be something uh, that uh, that we should do probably now. Um, so we could, um, I mean, think about the tech depths, uh, uh, trying to understand uh, uh, with respect to these two uh, values uh, where it is positioned uh, and so uh, do a sort of triage uh, and understand uh, if uh, it's something that uh, we could do now or in the future. Thanks, Rosa. Moving on. Okay, so until now we have uh, Mm, talked uh, about uh, different things uh, like uh, some mm, common but maybe bad ways to prioritize so Raul before was mentioning uh, like uh, taking into account uh, like single factors uh, to prioritize uh, uh, doing it basing uh, yeah for example on feelings uh, uh, just on competition and so on but uh, we have to say that fortunately there are also some good ways uh, um, which can help us to set priorities in a backlog uh, and also within uh, the different categories depending on the needs so just to present uh, for example some of them one uh, um, uh, one uh, good way that uh, we could use uh, is something that is called critical path so um, it is useful when we are designing uh, an mvp and we want to identify that uh, one thing uh, one feature that uh, will drive uh, our customer to buy um, there is the value effort metrics, so it, it's something useful when we want to prioritize, uh, for example, a small set of initiatives or a very specific problem, uh, identifying uh, like the opportunities that uh, meet all the criteria, for example. And there is also Moscow, uh, which is uh, must have, should have, uh, could have uh, and would have, uh, um, which uh, could be useful when um, uh, we feel some uncertainty in uh, trying to understand what should be included in a product uh, or a release, uh, maybe because our backlog uh, is so big uh, that uh, we need to do maybe many prioritizations. So one good uh, method could be starting uh, uh, saying, okay, which are the must-haves, uh, which are the should-haves, uh, and so on. So it, it, these uh, are just uh, some examples uh, of uh, methods and frameworks uh, which could help us uh, in um, in prioritizing. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of frameworks uh, that uh, could be used, uh, and every situation uh, is uh, different, uh, let's say, and uh, it has its own challenges. Uh, so we need, uh, there is no secret sauce uh, for prioritizing. We always have to think uh, about what's the situation, which are the problems that we encounter in and the challenges that we encounter in the specific situa situation in which we have, uh, take into account uh, all the factors uh, that surround us. Uh, I mean, uh, someone was saying that uh, it's not always possible, uh, but let's say the, the ones we, which uh, we are aware of uh, and try to prioritize taking into account uh, all these things. Yeah. Just, just also add, because Laura had a valid point, right? there are certain, uh, some urgent circumstances that pushes you to find solutions by stepping out the consistency and predictability comfort zone, which is true. But uh, like going back to what I was saying, I think it's important to understand these are all levers, right? So if you have to introduce something, for example, there's a complaints uh, issue and uh, the product has this problem and you need to try to solve that complaints problem. It means you need to maybe take some capacity from one of your different bucket, right? And spend your time there. And if there is an impact, you call out that impact. So all of what we talk about, maybe from prioritization standpoint, planning standpoint, also goes with, uh, works in tandem with what we call rates, right? 
So at any point in time, your product would have a lot of risks, assumption, issues, dependencies. This could, this also needs to be called out, so that your stakeholders are aware of what exactly is happening, right? And if there is a change in, let us say, the plan because of what is uh, being introduced to the team in terms of uh, backlog items, I think that also needs to be called out as part of your conversation with your stakeholders. So yes, I mean it's and never always an easy path, right? Uh, there'll always be some trick that uh, strikes you away from what you are uh, planning on doing. And very good question to ask, is prioritization a logical process? Of course, there's a lot of logic to how we prioritize, but there is no right way to prioritize, right? It's also important to customize the approach based on the needs and goals of the team as a whole. Uh, the goals of the team needs to be aligned with the goals of the uh, organization. It needs to be aligned to what customer problems you are set out to solve, right? But what is super important is autonomous teams tend to prioritize better. So if, if every member in the team is capable of asking why this needs to be done right now, right? What is the value that we're going to deliver to the customer? How are we going to measure the impact on what we're delivering? It will be easier to prioritize because you're being constantly challenged, right? And it's important that you find the right answers before you move or take one step ahead, right? Never underplay human element and motivation for the beneficiaries when you prioritize. I mean, it's always a. I mean, it's always also give and take. Right? You need to make sure that you, given you work with different stakeholders, you understand what, why they are. They also see uh, want you to prioritize some things over something else, right? And try to make sure you have a, a logical conversation with them, and also you're empathetic to understand what motivates them to get something prioritized. Why? Why is it super important for them, right? The beneficiary who is asking for something, and what data you can gather to be able to take a, an objective decision on whether you should prioritize it or not. Right. I mean, at the end of the day, we are all humans and never underplay the human element. That's super important. Individuals and interactions over processes and tools. No matter what process you follow, as long as you, you the team stays close to each other, you collaborate well among each other, you, you will get better at how you prioritize. I mean, there's no right way. The and you'll there'll always be a time when you're probably not right, right? The way you prioritized. But the team and the collaboration will actually help you move forward even in those situations. Is what we have learned. Now, to also say, prioritization is a continuous process that expresses adaptability while striving to achieve the desired outcome. Doing it right will give you the power to say no. Uh, given this is a very good quote, maybe we should end our talk here, and that's what we've done. Thanks a lot for joining us, folks. Uh, and, and, and thank you thanks. for having prioritized the uh, yeah, exactly. of an aperitivo. <laughs> yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you. So uh, thank you, Rosa. Thank you, Rahul. And um, we just launched um, a poll to get your feedback. So please compile. It is very valuable to us uh, and it helps us getting better. Every time, um, let me uh, take uh, more two minutes more of your time um, in order to uh, present to you the next event. Uh, we're going to have it um, on March 23. And uh, our colleague, Mani, will talk about monoliths um, in the front end and uh, how to break them with micro front ends. Uh, so thank you, everyone, and uh, have a nice evening.